All right, good evening. My name is Jim Strelp. I'm this year's president of the Architects Association. And welcome to the fourth and final lecture in our 2011 series, presented jointly by the Architects Association and Habitat for Humanity, Santa Cruz County. Tonight, we're proud to present another very good local architect, Jeff Oberdorfer. Jeff has been a resident of Felton for over 30 years. He knows our county well, having prepared planning studies for many of the areas of the county during his uh, private practice here in the 1980s and early 90s. In the mid-1990s, Jeff became principal architect and led the urban design studio at the San Jose Redevelopment Agency. In 2000, he became executive director of First Community Housing in San Jose. And in 2005, he became a certified development specialist from the AIA. He is a pioneer in the design and construction of green affordable housing. Please welcome Jeff Oberdorfer. Well, thank you, and thanks everybody for showing up tonight. Uh, I'd like to start out real quickly by showing a four and a half minute video to kind of break the ice. Uh, this is a video that was produced by the Home Depot Foundation uh, several years ago. One of our buildings won the uh, title of Best Green Affordable Housing Project in the Country. And as part of that process, the Home Depot Foundation did a video uh, describing all the components of the building. So I thought I'd start with that. And since it uh, wasn't produced by us, you know it's totally objective. So it's going to take me a minute just to get this started here. San Jose is one of the one or two most expensive uh, metropolitan areas in which to build housing in this country. What First Community Housing represents here is an innovative approach to building affordable housing, to building sustainable housing. It's that kind of innovation which has been the hallmark here in Silicon Valley uh, for decades. So Casa Feliz, our mission statement, was to build 60 units of single room occupancies to replace an existing 60-unit SRO and to have 35% of the tenancy be uh, tenants with developmental disabilities. What we wanted was something that would have long-term use and would benefit not only the developer in cost savings because of its green features, but also would make it more comfortable for the residents who could benefit from those green features. One of the major green features of any building is proximity to transit and public transportation. First Community Housing is very unique in that it offers a free eco-pass to all of its residents. For people with developmental disabilities, one of the big issues that comes with our population is isolation. With the use of the eco-passes, our residents are able to be a part of the greater community too, um, have an easier time shopping and going to doctor's appointments. We've got a really good team, well-trained, with a positive attitude about trying to make change, and so it's reflected in the buildings. This project, to me, is one that we use to educate all of our clients about sustainability issues. Conserving water is one of the most important uh, sustainability goals in California, and um, this particular project did many things. It looked at everything from the landscaping and putting in drought-tolerant plants to, of course, the significant feature, which is the vegetated roof. The green roof is our first green roof in the city of San Jose. It cleans the water that does go through it. It helps reduce the heat gain on the building, so our operating expenses are lower. Our corporate goal is that all our buildings are lead gold. Green building is not just about saving energy. I think an important aspect is also indoor air quality and what it does for the health of our tenants. We put in low toxic adhesives, paints, coatings, carpet, all materials that are not going to off-gas and therefore the tenants feel better. There are certain areas where the sustainable agenda and the emotional architectural agenda coalesce re really wonderfully. That has to do with daylight and natural ventilation. Daylighting in this building was absolutely critical because it's such a dense building on a small site. The massing of the building is designed to bring that daylight deep into the core of the building, and I think the tenants even recognize that. Residents love it here. It's a great environment. When you walk into Casa Feliz Studios, you don't know which units are for people with developmental disabilities and which units are not. And because of that, it really gives our residents a chance to be 
really truly part of the greater community. I just love be living at Kesafilis because it's a really great for other individuals with my my type of disability to really go within themselves and give them the energy the stem to go on in life. We absolutely want to see more Casa Felices built in the community and the fact that First Community Housing is a recipient of this award demonstrates the quality that you can have in an affordable development and that it can be green and sustainable, good for the environment and good for the community and good for the residents that are in there. So what I wanted to talk about tonight was high-density TOD housing and uh, its relationship particularly to um, what might happen in Santa Cruz in the future based on some of the experience that we've had as a nonprofit over the past uh, 11 or 12 years building primarily TOD um, housing that's fairly dense. So first of all, I wanted to present the quote from Bill Witte, which I think is kind of interesting. Um, one of the problems we have primarily now, I think with the word green and also with the word TOD or smart growth, is everybody advocates for it, but nobody knows what it means or how to implement it. And this, Bill Witte is the president of the related companies. He was for a long time the director of housing in San Francisco. He's probably one of the smartest developers I've ever met. He does market rate and affordable housing and mixed use housing. And this was a quote from a uh, Urban Land Institute conference a couple of weeks ago talking about the problems meeting the expectations that the public and planners have with smart growth, transit oriented development and the word green. And the fact is that every housing element, every general plan that's out now is based on villages and smart growth and TOD with no way to implement that, particularly with no relationship to the transit that needs to happen to make it happen. So uh, for instance, uh, here in Santa Cruz, to make transit work so people actually get out of their cars, we're really talking about a realignment and change in all the streets in Santa Cruz so that there's more efficient buses so people get out of their cars. So. This is one of the issues, and I want to talk about it, and I'm not going to talk about transit because that's not my area of expertise, or I'm, I'm not going to talk about the design of the streets. So again, I'm giving an incomplete presentation because I'm not talking about the key element in this issue, which is transit and whether it works or not, and it gets people out of their cars. So recent policies supporting mixed-use development don't offer realistic implementation strategies. Developing transit-adjacent housing is not sufficient or sustainable. And I'm making a differentiation between transit adjacent and transit oriented. So a lot of people talk about TOD, transit oriented development. Most of it's transit adjacent, which isn't necessarily sustainable. If you build housing next to transit and everybody drives, then what's the purpose? So the question is, how do you get people out of cars? So and the same thing is true with retail. And I could show you two blocks in San Jose in Japantown, a first floor empty retail that was demanded by the planning department and the redevelopment agency to activate the streets and generate income for the city. It doesn't work. So, you know, it's not just location, location, location. It's also density and transit and luck. So the, what I'm going to focus on tonight are the issues that we've confronted trying to do green affordable housing in either transit adjacent or transit oriented uh, infill sites. And also to focus to some extent on what architects and nonprofit developers can do because I think that the general public really has very little idea of the potential that nonprofits have as developers to be in partnerships and contribute significantly to uh, mixed use development. So with that, I wanted to start just talking a little bit about what affordable housing is from a structural point of view. You all know that it's for people of low income. But 
There's more to it than that. One is that we own our properties for 55 years. Uh, the project we just built in, Cal in um, Capitola, actually, the council made it 75 years. So we're really concerned about durability. We don't build projects and spin them. We don't sell them in two to three years. Our attitudes about both our tenants, the sites, the sustainability of the sites, and the durability is critical. So durability to us is really important. Uh, also, quality architectural, and you see that hopefully throughout this uh, slideshow. And also sustainability, what I'm calling, what we're doing is deep green. And I say that because almost everybody now is claiming they're green, so we're now deep green, just to make a difference. Um, if you look in the good times, every real estate agent, every interior decorator is now green. Uh, construction firms that have one lead AP on site are now saying they offer sustainable design guidance to um, people. So you have to be very careful. Uh, also, again, the difference between transit adjacent and transit oriented. Uh, we look at our entire portfolio from a sustainable point of view. We have 16 properties with four uh, on the drawing boards ready to come online. And also, we're very interested in mainstreaming special needs populations. And I'll talk about that as well from the benefits that has to the development and particularly to density and parking standards. And we specialize in urban infill projects that are from 25% to 60% AMI, which is average median income in the county. So those are rentals that are below market. And we also see ourselves as leaders in the transformation in housing, in uh, green affordable housing. On an individual case, building by building, we're very concerned with tenant health. We have all our properties are no smoking. Uh, we're looking at optimizing density, as any developer would. We're interested in site responsive design, adjacencies to transit and retail. We also give free annual eco passes in Santa Clara County to all our clients and tenants. And I'll talk about that a little bit. We tried to do it here in Santa Cruz, but folks weren't real responsive to it. And I can talk about that because I think it has a direct relationship to whether people get out of their cars and whether developers can lose um, parking to increase density along our transit lines. So we're also interested in fiscal sustainability. In other words, our properties have to cash flow for the life of the property. And to do that, we have to know what we're doing. We have to have energy efficient buildings, uh, energy efficient landscapes. And we also do all our projects with the negotiated design build <coughs> process. And this is the benefit of being the owner and the person in charge. I got rid of bidding. This is something when I was in private practice here in Santa Cruz was just a nightmare. It, it's just the wrong way to do any kind of development. Uh, the architect and the contractor are already, always at each other's t uh, teeth, especially in a low bid uh, situation. I remember sitting at bid openings here in Santa Cruz and hearing contractors that they didn't know I was the architect say, I never would have got this job if I didn't make the mistakes in the mechanical section or whatever it was. Then they tried to bid it back up during the process, and you all know that. Our processes don't work like that. Our process, we have the architect and the general contractor and every one of the major subs at the table from day one with a contract, and they're all working together in a creative way. We're now on our fifth project with each team we have. We have three architects and two contractors we're using right now. So by the time we're on our fourth and fifth team, this team is humming. There's no conflicts, very few change orders. And it's actually Rob Quigley, who you saw in the video, said it's more fun than he's ever had doing any architecture. This is uh, Paseo Studios out near um, Westgate Shopping Center. And you can see a typical interior. This is a 300 square foot SRO. Uh, the floors tend to be carpet tile and linoleum, uh, Forbo, real linoleum. The uh, cabinets are non-formaldehyde, non-toxic MDF and so are the, um, the countertops and um, all the built-ins. The bed is a uh, FSC certified maple bed. So indoor air quality is really important to us. And what we've found in some of our properties is that the clients, the tenants, are actually responding to the quality of the indoor air uh, environment. So we have uh, one young man who's uh, 25 now, I think, who has uh, pretty severe autism. He has two live-in um, 
aides that live with him in a three-bedroom apartment. Since he's moved into our Gish Apartments, which is a lead gold building, he no longer has asthma, which he's had since a child, and he's no longer on anti-anxiety meds, just from moving into a building that's non-toxic. So, so this is a, an aerial view of uh, Paseo. And um, again, the reason we're able to build this building is we've been doing eco passes for 10 years, and we got our parking requirement down for SROs and studios to 0.42. It's usually 1 to 1.5 in San Jose. So this is the reason why we can build buildings that are dense, is that we've proven by giving people eco-passes in Santa Clara County that they will use them. So a low-income person, for instance, a senior may save $800 a year by us spending money buying them an eco-pass. Uh, family, you figure no car insurance, no car, could save up to 3000 our family developments, most families only have one car, not two. So it's pretty huge in terms of what we've done. We've also brought on a traffic engineer to go to our properties, count the parking space, and do a traffic study that we present to planning departments, and they buy off on it. So this is a, a key issue here. And again, this is a kind of a horrible example of how we plan right now these one- and two-story buildings with empty roofs. They are cool roofs, they are reflective, they don't have vegetation, they could have one or two stories of housing above them, they don't. When we built this building near Westgate Shopping Center, I worked actually with the council member, Linda Lazat, very uh, excited about doing this building, and we went to the managers of both of the shopping centers. This is right on the Saratoga, uh, San Jose line and saw what we could do to place people in jobs because we thought this would be great workforce housing. So after we had it filled, and it's been filled since the day it's opened with a 200-person waiting list, we've surveyed our tenants and we found out that only 10% of them work in the shopping centers. All the other folks live there because they love being near the shopping center because of the restaurants, the entertainment, the movies. This is actually their community which is not something that we had uh, thought about before. So again, with the transit passes in Santa Clara, we're the largest purchaser in the county, and um, we purchase probably 1500 a year at a fixed price. And in San Jose, and probably here as well, a structured parking space that's made out of concrete usually runs about forty to $50,000, you know, an asphalt space, maybe seventeen to twenty, depending on the situation. We spend less than $65,000 buying eco passes for all our tenants. So if we save five to six spaces in one development, we've already made back what we're doing with the eco passes each year. So the math is not complex, and it's amazing that more developers don't do this, but um, most don't want to spend the money. But for us, it's proven to be a tremendous benefit because of the deduct we get in the parking ratio. So the high-density corridors require coordination between planners, developers, and transit pass costs. And this is really important. The reason we don't buy transit passes in Santa Cruz for our tenants in Capitola is that Metro will not give us a fixed price. They want to charge a fixed price, and then at the end of the year, charge us for the additional that each person has put on their ticket. Well, as a nonprofit, we need to have a fixed price. I'd rather pay more up front than not know at the end of the year what we're going to owe. So this is something that's very difficult to uh, try to get across to Metro folks, and we've had the same problem with Samtrans in San Mateo. Um, it's really a great way to reduce parking needs. So again, after 10 years, we had Hexagon do traffic studies on our uh, SROs, one bedroom, seniors, and also on our family properties, which they're doing right now. We have our seniors down to 0.62 per unit and our studios 0.42. But not only that, and this is the reason why it's so important for us to work with special needs, besides the fact that there's a huge need for them to have housing, and not just the ADA housing that's set aside in multifamily, where most people who have disabilities won't go because they have no sense of community, people with developmental disabilities do not drive. And the regional center in San Andreas has actually sent us documentation that they don't drive. 
We've also had the uh, Monterey County Social Services Department send us documentation they've done that chronically ill seniors park at about 0.5. Now, planning departments are accepting this from us now. So what it means is not only are we getting the deduct for the transit passes, if we have 25 to 35 percent of our tenants being mainstreamed at no parking, you can imagine the density that we're starting to get. Now there's other benefits as well to the special needs populations. One is that they're around during the daytime, they're great tenants, they're living on their own for the first time, they're enthusiastic tenants. Um, it's actually something that is not just something a nonprofit could do. There's no reason a for-profit couldn't do this as well and just partner with a nonprofit agency that provides services. So again, synchronicities. The indoor air quality, tenant health, and special populations is a huge synchronicity with lead buildings. <laughs> and then the reduced parking and increased density, as I've talked about. The uh, slide here is a Rob Quigley design that we have on the boards <coughs> now that would have been built if it wasn't for a governor killing redevelopment. And uh, this is something we can talk about if you want, but <coughs> hundreds and hundreds of affordable housing projects that were in process are now on hold because of the governor's raid on redevelopment, and it's not looking good. This is 135 studios. They're 450 square feet apiece um, in San Jose with 35% again of special needs population, over 11,000 square foot of neighborhood retail. And what's interesting about this in relationship to mixed use is that we cannot pay for retail. We don't get money for it for tax credits or from HUD. We have to sell the retail back to a, a partner. In this case, it's also the landowner and the seller. But what, what it means is that we're also building the shell of the building and only selling back the cost of half the concrete floor, half the concrete ceiling, and the walls. So the private developer who's doing the first floor is getting a tremendous bargain. And instead of doing a one-story wood building, he's getting a concrete building that's going to last for at least 150 years. And what's important about this is that it's our affordable housing finance that's paying for the frame of the retail. And then we turn around to the seller and sell them the interior square footage as a condominium. So um, this is something to think about that a for-profit developer cannot do, but we can. And I think that's one thing I wanted to talk about is that there's a real opportunity for nonprofit developers to have some savvy to be on teams and really help the team make things come through that normally couldn't. And I'll give you an example here in Santa Cruz in a minute. This is our uh, Gish Apartments. Uh, Jerry King was the architect and uh, talking about some of the issues that impact transit-oriented design. Um, it's our typical building, 35% special needs, free annual eco passes, all our typical green features. It is LEED NC Gold and LEED for Homes Gold. It was also an AAA Coat National Top 10 Award winner in 2009. The issue here is that when you build along rail lines, particularly transit, there are acoustic issues that you have to deal with that when people write the general plans about how great it is to have buildings next to transit, they don't think about. There are extra costs building next to transit and high-speed bus lines. There's vibration, there's dust, there's acoustic issues. When we did this building, the first thing we talked about was not doing the balconies because the acoustic issues of STC 45, trying to make that work, were so huge. But then we came up with the idea of doing the balconies so that the uh, STC rating was on the glass facing transit, but in the front of the building facing you, it would be open. And what this means in small units is that people have ventilation, but they also have these wonderful, well-lit balconies. And uh, every award we win for this building, and we've won many, always points to those balconies as the key feature in the building. So it's interesting because the first thought we had was that we could have gotten a variance to get rid of the balconies, and the planning department would have proved it no problem because of the acoustic issues but instead we went ahead and incorporated them and they became the major design feature. Also, one of the problems we had here was that we have to have below grade parking. 
And one of the issues was that even though the planning department gave us huge deductions for parking for the residential, in San Jose, the Department of Public Works would have to give us the variation for the retail, and they wouldn't. So we have 20 parking spaces for the 7-Eleven, and there's no more than five ever used. Not only that, the first year this was open, the 7-Eleven was the largest volume 7-Eleven in the state of California. Why? <laughs> because it's right across from a major transit stop. People go on the transit, get off, get a Coke or whatever. It's also great for our tenants because they can go down and get milk or whatever. And really the interesting thing about this was that this was a site that was owned by Southland Corporation, the 7-Eleven. And they came up with a one-story building with a condo behind it with a, a parking variation request of about 30 spaces. And the planning department and the council member just said there's no way. And they actually recommended that 7-Eleven contact us a nonprofit to do the design work and take it through the entitlements. And since then, we've been partners with the person from 7-Eleven who uh, partnered with us on this. This is another condo. So we <laughs> bought the property from 7-Eleven and sold them back the first floor. Yeah. just want to make sure. So when we're looking at that, am I seeing a glazed uh, one side of the balcony and then it's open on the other? Mm -hmm. that it's glazed on the side facing the tracks yes. and it's open here except for the first 42 inches. Sure. So on that side. Uh, and I think I have an interior shot later. Thank you. Sure. So here's a better shot. You can see the transit line. Now here's another project in uh, Redwood City and this also uh, very similar. The issues here again I think that people don't think about and it's important in Santa Cruz, is that when you do below grade parking, there's almost always water seepage. There's also lighting and uh, CO2 monitors that have to be on 24-7. It's amazingly expensive to do below grade parking. We just avoid it now uh, with everything we can. Um, but that's something to think about when you're trying to do uh, near transit, not only the vibration, but the water, the cost of the below grade parking really, really make it difficult to make a building work. We made it work on this building, but we've had really severe costs on the maintenance of the building from that. But on the other hand, Redwood City was really excited about this building. It was the first building in the El Camino design competition for the Grand Boulevard and uh, we won for that and they put a lot of money into the exterior building materials so everything you see on this building is real materials there's no foam it's all uh, stucco um, masonry but what I really wanted to point out was that our design teams who did this two different architects same contractor all the same subcontractors same heating system same finished materials. By doing them both together, building them at the same time, we saved two to three percent. The two to three percent was the difference in doing lead gold. And that was lead gold NC, new commercial at the time. That was before mid-rise came out. Probably with mid-rise out now, these buildings would have been platinum because NC was just so much more difficult for residential. Yeah? How did that building get over park? That's on the last slide. Oh, well, this is the reason that I got over parked. I'm sorry, I should have gotten into that. Was that the city wanted us to do retail. And we did this little corner retail. You can see it in the corner right over there, um, which really has never worked. And they did it to promise us that we could use a mixed use parking ratio, which would have cut the parking down quite a bit. But the neighbors came and complained. And this is something you'll see in every city where the adjacent neighborhood is non-conforming and has been for 40 years and the building that's going in is going to be the only building in the neighborhood that meets parking standards but the planning commission the city council give in to the neighborhood so here the neighborhood was non-standard parking we meet parking standards but a year after the building was built we were conditioned to come back into a parking study to prove that our people weren't parking on the street we have 40 empty parking spaces in this building because it's so efficient, it's near transit. 
we probably could have gotten away without doing the below grade parking, just on grade. And this is very typical. I was on the zoning board here uh, for four years in Santa Cruz, and we were overturned always by the city council when a neighborhood group showed up. And everybody knew that the neighborhood was non-conforming in parking and the new building wasn't. But that never gets through. So that's why it was overparked. What's your plan to convert that uh, unused parking into? You know, we've thought about that. And the diff difficult issue is our funder is the tax credits. And we cannot sell that parking. We cannot rent it to another nonprofit. We can close it off at some point and get rid of the CO2 monitors and the ventilation if we can get the parking down so that we have no need for it downstairs, which is what our aim is now. Just close it off and be empty? Yeah, we have parking on the first floor at grade, and then we have a parking below. But you couldn't use that space for anything else? No. No, it's below grade, it's high water table, and once you use it, you have to have the CO2 monitors and the ventilation and the lighting, and that's what's costing us a fortune even though we've just switched over to uh, induction lighting and LED lighting. Still very expensive. So Casa Feliz you've seen, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this. The uh, building up to the right is um, San Jose State, the new dorms that built about five or six years ago. This is an area that used to be a beautiful Victorian neighborhood until the 50s when architects and planners lost their minds and let these horrible box buildings get built that were called garden apartments probably because they had no open space <laughs> and not enough parking. And now, of course, there are gold mines because the owners have paid off the mortgages and they're charging amazing rents to students and low-income people, and you can't afford to buy them because there's no way you can make up for that. But uh, this was our first vegetated roof, as it said in the video, and you can see here how Quigley tried to make the massing of the building work with the massing of the 50s boxes that were around it. <laughs> and um, also, the, the issue here is that state law says that you have to replace existing affordable housing with the same number of units. The building that was there before, which is affordable housing, was uh, one of the original um, privately owned dorms, and then a sorority house. And it went into disrepair, but because it was used as low-income housing, we had to replace the 60 units. The 60 units that were there before had congregate baths and a congregate dining room. We have handicapped baths in each room and full kitchens. So it doesn't make any sense, but we had to do it. Uh, the neighbors were so supportive of this project because they wanted to get rid of the one that was there that they worked with us very rigorously. The council member told us that we'd probably have to do a pseudo-historic building because it's a Victorian neighborhood. And interestingly enough, the, um, she didn't call it pseudo-historic, that's the architectural terminology that I use, but, um, uh, but anyway, uh, the neighbors said no. We want something new. This neighborhood has so much old building in it. We want something contemporary and new, and they actually helped us select the colors of the building and supported us getting a fourth floor va uh, variance to get the other units in. So the story of the green roof is that I showed you this is two blocks from San Jose State. There's been no development in this area for 30 years. Public Works said we'd like you to spend $350,000 and put in a new storm drain as a gift to the city because you need to connect to what's up at San Jose State. And we had been working is with Rana Creek for a while, who are probably the premier uh, green roof people in the West Coast. And I called up Paul Kephart and I said, um, what can you do for the same amount of money or less? And we got the green roof, plus landscaping in the back with um, storage capacity that we only had to do a 10-year upgrade across the street and didn't have to do uh, the tie-in and we actually wound up with a vegetated roof. And you'll see the PVs on the roof. Whoops. The reason we did the PVs is that it's been proved now in studies in Europe that with vegetation below the PVs, the photovoltaics, that the efficiency of the photovoltaics goes up about 20%. In case of coal. Yeah, exactly. So here again, the PVs on the bottom. This is a standard. Uh, unit on the first floor, which has 14-foot ceilings, so it's not the same as the other units on the upper floors, but you can get a sense of the unit design. And this is the uh, lobby. So again, looking at parking reductions, 
60 units because of our history with eco passes and because 35 percent of the tenant population was uh, developmentally disabled we only have 21 spaces that made the project work we couldn't have done it without getting down to 21 spaces i've been there i don't know since it's open 50 60 times there's always 10 or 11 spaces empty so and we're right across from 10th street where the major bus line is so some lessons learned, and here's the interior shot, Hugh, of the uh, Gish balcony. You can see what it does to the units to have that kind of space. It's amazing. Um, it's our belief that any project should be able to get LEED certified or a Greenpoint score of 75 points. It's a no-brainer. There's no reason why any architect, developer, or client should ever fight doing it. It's just amazingly easy to get 75 points. Matter of fact, KB Homes was saying that they were going to do all their projects and promise at least 75 points on um, Greenpoint. Also, again, to just emphasize, adjacency to transit and bus routes are optimal, but there's acoustic ventilation and air quality issues that are going to cost you more to build a building that's more durable. So building near transit isn't necessarily less expensive, even with parking reductions. And I've talked about the mechanical ventilation and also to do green, as most of you probably know, it has to be integrated up front and not added on later. And the synchronicity between uh, special needs tenants I've talked about. So let's talk about my favorite development opportunities that don't happen in Santa Cruz. Some of you may have been involved in the Whole Foods market out at Soquel when it first went in. I know a number of developers were looking at it. The reason it didn't work is people had to do underground parking to get the units. So everything I've tried to lay out today is the reason why a nonprofit could have helped because we could have worked with seniors, people with disabilities, and got some housing on top of that Whole Foods and not had to go to below grade parking. So again, that kind of partnership is something that we've been exploring a lot in San Jose and we're hoping to begin exploring it in Santa Cruz as well. And now my new favorite place is the Safeway where um, catacornered on Morrissey, where Staff of Life used to be, uh, this Safeway is due for an upgrade and has been for a long time. And if you take the Staff of Life property and the parking behind it, this is just a gold mine for three or four story housing over a, a Safeway or whatever. And the key here, and I learned it when I was principal architect at the redevelopment agency, is you have to have a city planning department and redevelopment agency that has the money and the wherewithal to immediately, when a developer approaches them, turn it into something other than what the developer is going to show you. In other words, can you do housing? And the first answer is going to be no. What if we put money into it? What if we reduce parking requirements? So this is how the San Jose redevelopment agency worked, and it was a very successful model. Now, we also had a lot of money at the time, and that's key because if you can put gap financing in, people turn around very quickly. And that's probably not going to happen in the near future. But this is one of those examples where when somebody begins to look at an application, and probably most of the brokers in Santa Cruz who deal with Safeways know what they're thinking and would know before they even applied for a permit, you need to go to them right away and say, we want to do housing on top of that, and we'll work with you to make it work. Can you comment on the standalone inclusionary housing? Oh, yeah, thank you. Um, Many cities have requirements for inclusionary housing, usually 20%, which means that any developer that puts in housing, 20% of it has to be affordable, either for sale or um, rental. Uh, this has been challenged in LA on a court case now, but it's pretty much still moving through, and a lot of cities have it. Taking my experience from the zoning board, when I sat on the zoning board here, the inclusionary units are always the worst units in the project. They're actually at near the dumpster or near the parking area or they're in shade or they don't have good views. That's not always the case, but generally that's the case. They're the smallest units. Um, you always know who the people are living in these units. Now, people in, interested in social policy will argue, yes, but we're integrating these people into a market rate development. So sometimes that's fine. Most of the time, the developer has an option of paying an in-lieu fee, which most cities allow. And the third option is what we call standalone. And we've now done two of these. A standalone is where if there's enough inclusionary units required, 
a nonprofit like us will build a standalone building that is the inclusionary for the developer. So what the developer has to do is pay us what the city would normally pay us as gap financing to build the building, which normally is less than they'd have to pay to do the fees. And the reason that developers like this is twofold. One, they don't like the city looking at their books every year and examining the property, which is what happens. And two, in a larger complex, and we just are doing one now, a nonprofit developer like us in a competition for state funds, for instance, we just got $24 million of state funds for a project in San Jose where we're partnering with Intracore and Barry Swenson, and they're building uh, 450 units and we're doing 135 units of the standalone inclusionary. But all the points that we got in the competition for special needs for low income and from green building are coming from us. So that's what we offered to the partnership, and that's what got us over the edge when we got that award. So the housing is financed partly by the public sector and partly by the private sector? Uh, well, the housing is financed almost totally by the private sector instead of an inclusionary fee. What we go out and do then is we get the tax credits, which is basically a program where corporations buy tax credits and make money on the loss <coughs> and depreciation of the property. You couldn't do this with HUD funding. You can do this with tax credits, which is where we work. Uh, we, we practice HUD avoidance as much as possible. <laughs> but, um. So anyway, this is just a couple of ideas about how to look at projects. And this is what I look at when I drive around Santa Cruz or San Jose, as I'm always looking uh, for these kind of opportunities. So on retail, a lot of jurisdictions actually require retail, sometimes, as you know, where it doesn't work. If you are required to do retail, make sure that you don't go it alone. Bring in somebody like a commercial broker or a retail expert that knows what they're doing. And also plan for the correct retail floor height. There's nothing worse than going in with a residential project and having people force you to put retail in it where it doesn't work. Um, right now, what we're finding is that most tenants don't want to buy a condo on the first floor unless they're also developer investors. They want you to do the TIs and maybe, if you're lucky, get a 10 to 12 year lease. So it, it's very tough to do um, retail. And uh, my opinion, also as an architect, is that it's better to have no retail than empty retail. And if the issue with retail from a planning perspective is to activate the street, there's other ways to activate the street besides retail. Residential lobbies are great. We often put our uh, community rooms or gyms in our projects on the first floor, the manager's office. So we can activate the street without retail. Um, so that's the end. Thank you very much, and I, I hope I didn't speed through it too quickly. I'd be happy to answer any questions. The question was, how do you think we can get more of these projects built in Santa Cruz County? Um, I think there's a lot of answers to that. One is, unfortunately, right now, with the governor trying to kill redevelopment, there is no way to build affordable housing. The 20% money that came from redevelopment, which is how we funded affordable housing, is pretty much gone right now unless the Supreme Court rules against the governor, which it doesn't look like he will. So we don't even know if redevelopment agencies now can buy into it and opt in to pay a fee. So it's really, uh, it's almost like the state shooting itself in the foot because I think there's probably hundreds of millions of dollars of development projects on hold in cities throughout California that were redevelopment oriented. So we have to find another funding source besides redevelopment if redevelopment is killed. The biggest thing in my opinion is that we need to start thinking about transit in a more creative way and this could be fairly controversial because uh, to do that we either have to take parking off the street or go to one-way streets and they're doing this now, believe it or not, 18 governments in uh, San Jose, Santa, uh, Santa Clara County and San Mateo County that uh, constitute El Camino Real have come together with what's called the Grand Boulevard Initiative and they're trying to say how do we take this ugly horrible road and beautify it in a way that coordinates and makes sense and one of the things they're doing is uh, taking the roadway which sometimes is four to six lanes wide and putting in express buses with their own lanes with bicycle lanes so once you have bicycles and buses separate and they can move faster, 
It solves most of the problems that we have, in my opinion, with getting people out of the car. So we have to look at that, and transit ex is expensive. I think I was told last week in the Samtrans that only 18% of the money for Samtrans to run Samtrans comes from uh, fees. The rest is subsidy. Yeah, the, the question is, is it worth it to pay the fees for LEED certification? And um, as, a, as a single family homeowner, if you wanted to do it, it's really totally up to you. I'm talking for a multiple. Absolutely. Absolutely, it's worth it for us. Uh, first of all, if we're doing a 20 to $30 million project, to spend right now eighty dollars to $100,000 for the lead consultants that are not only doing the lead work, but are also fine-tuning our HVAC systems, uh, helping us with other kinds of issues, it's really a drop in the bucket. Not only that, we have a reputation now that when we go places, people know that we are a green builder. We're not just saying we do green certified stuff or we do something like LEED. Um, I like LEED because it's the only national standard that's objectively um, analyzed by our peers. And um, if you get gold, you got gold. You know, it's, and a lot of my nonprofit competitors will come up to a council meeting and say, we're gonna do a green building. And what, what does that mean? Well, we're gonna do linoleum and PVs. That's not a green building. Those are both very nice things to do. So with so many people saying they're green, I like the LEED system because it documents the fact that we are, and there's no question about it. And our new projects now are all approaching platinum. And actually, we're moving now to the point where we're looking at the living building challenge because we want to go beyond LEED. We have uh, one of our new buildings under construction now will be one of the first buildings in the United States that's all LED lighting. And now we found a manufacturer in Hayward that's actually going to build all our lighting fixtures for us from scratch instead of getting them from China, which is what we do now, is everything that we get lighting fixtures wise comes in from China. It's assembled here. It's not made in the United States. So we found a manufacturer that's going to do that. So uh, from my point of view, from First Community Housing's point of view, it's absolutely essential and it's a drop in the bucket in terms of the overall cost of a project. Mm -hmm. So the question is, you know, was I disparaging retail and what could go there? Um, I, I think... Oh, exactly, exactly. And there's some places, for instance, in light industrial, where light industrial works, but planning wouldn't allow it, even though I think it's sometimes very appropriate. You know, if you had artist lofts above light industrial, I think it's fine. You know, furniture maker on the first floor, artists on the top floors. Really? Yeah, why not? Noise? Well, you can separate noise. I mean, we have parking structures on the first floor separated with a concrete podium. So you can certainly do that. So I think you just have to figure out if it works. You know, if you think it works and the people who are doing the first floor uh, think the location's good and you can make it work with the separation, why not? Anybody else? No? Well, great. Thank you very much. Okay, next year we're going to have another four-part lecture series, much like this year. It's going to be called The Four Elements. We're going to be looking at earth, wind, fire, and water, and how they're related to residential construction and also some commercial construction. So thanks for coming, and take a look at our website. It's aascc.org, and you'll see events coming up. Thanks very much for coming tonight.